We're going to get into a lot of nitty gritty details about plans, but before we do, I just want to start out by giving a little bit of big picture and overviewing the different types of plans. So uh, um, the basic sort of broad picture is thinking back over Earth's history. Uh, if you go back in time, right, life starts in water and you have these land masses that form. And at first, those land masses are bare rock. Uh, and so there's no life on them. There's there's all this water, uh, all this life evolving in water, but this this bare rock on land. The first thing that starts growing on that bare rock is cyanobacteria, so photosynthetic bacteria. So they start to form these crusts that starts to break down the rock. Um, maybe fungi eventually start to come in as well to decompose some stuff there, break down the rock more. Um, but really, it's not until land plants come onto these surfaces um, that they evolve from water dwelling plants to land plants that we start to see the development of what we would really consider soil. Soil is this mix of minerals and rocks as well as broken down organic matter that comes from plants first. So we start to build up these substantial soils that leads the way for later plants to evolve. So all the diversity of modern plants comes after we start to get these soils. And then animals aren't able to come onto land until plants are because animals need that food source. So this movement of algae to land is a huge and significant milestone in um, life for life on earth. The fossil record for plants is relatively complete. Um, we get a lot of these types of fossils of plants. These are like imprint type fossils. Um, and you get a lot of structural um, features. So you can tell that this flower has true leaves. Um, sorry, this plant has true leaves and um, flowers and stems. So a lot of evidence can be found in the fossil record. So um, the evolution of land plants, there's kind of three big um, broader features that align up with other events on Earth. So um, again, we're talking a lot about this first milestone of, of algae colonizing land habitats or terrestrial habitats outside of water. Um, and then in it, once plants are on land, there's two, a couple of other big things that happen. So in addition to building substantial soils, early plants, the seedless plants, also have a major impact on Earth's ecology in other ways besides soils. So um, affecting the, the ratios of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, so especially pulling carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is going to change Earth's climate um, over time. Um, and then a third major event uh, is aligned with a major event in animal evolution as well, which is the KT event when the meteor hits Earth, um, causes the extinction of the dinosaurs. So you maybe have heard about it, of it in that context, um, but it also radically changes plant evolution. And um, the, most of the plants that are around today are in the angiosperm lineage. And we see that transition after the KT event um, where you see a flourishing of the angiosperms. So again, just kind of starting out by putting plants in the broader co uh, context of Earth before we get into the nitty gritty details. So um, we're talking about supergroup land plants and algal relatives um, in this chapter. And Kingdom Plantae is the majority of it. So Kingdom Plantae is the true land plants. Um, <clears throat> So one of the big characteristics of this group is that they're multicellular. Um, they contain plastids. So the most iconic plastid is the chloroplast. <clears throat> they primarily live on land, so their name is land plants. We do have some land plants that have gone back to water. So probably uh, the most well-known example of this would be something like a water lily. A water lily is a land plant, even though it lives in water. Their ancestors are the green algal, their green algal relatives who are also part of their, the supergroup with them. And these were aquatic organisms. <clears throat> so the difference between the algal ancestors, the green algae ancestors, and the land plants is primarily adaptations for life on land. So adaptations to terrestrial life. So how are they gonna tolerate living in land? Land has a lot of challenges, right? It's drier, 
it's warmer. Um, how are they going to get water? Um, how are they going to stay moist? How are they going to reproduce without water? Um, how are they going to resist gravity? All of these challenges occur once they try and live on land. And so land plants have ways to, to adapt to that. <clears throat> so their ancestors were protists. So protist ancestor. The protist ancestor probably had a complex body. Um, so their simplest relatives had um, were maybe single-celled or single-celled, here's a single-celled one, colonial, but then their most recent ancestors were complex, filamentous, and even branching. Um, so that's an example here. The complex streptophyte algae are their closest ancestors. Um, when you look at this micrograph, you'll see that one of the things that even though they have like this it kind of looks like stems. It's not stems, um, but they get this sort of complex structure. But if you look at them in a micrograph, you see that they're a single cell thick. So while they do have this body that has these different parts to it, they're really only one cell thick. Um, and that's an important distinction because plants will be thicker than that. And that will be one of the ways that they resist drying out. Um, Cara or Colocati are the most, the modern protists that are around today that we think are the most closely related. Um, so these Caraphysians, see the shared um, roots there, um, have several derived traits with land plants. So they have a lot in common with land plants. So again, we're talking about these guys here, okay? Um, they have a distinctive type of cytokinesis. Remember, cytokinesis is the end of mitosis when the cell actually divides the cytoplasm. And because they have a cell wall, they're going to form a cell plate to carry out cytokinesis. And we already see that in the Caraphysians. Um, they have a cell junction called a plasmodesmata, just like plants do. So if you have two cells next to each other, and this is the cell membrane, Okay, and this outer part, I'll just go ahead and change its color. That's the cell walls. And the cells want to be able to communicate with each other. And so the way they do that, if they have a cell wall, is they have a little tube that goes between their plasma membranes. And that's a plasmodesmata. And again, this is related to having a cell wall and we see it arise in the Caraphysians. And then sexual reproduction um, using an egg and a sperm is also already occurring in the complex algae. <clears throat> Traits that are unique to the land plants, again, suggest that they are early adaptations to life on land. And so these are traits we find in all land plants. Okay, so I'm gonna Put that here. So these are shared derived characters of kingdom plantae. So we see genes that help them tolerate heat and drought more. So we see genetic changes that are adaptations to heat and drought. Um, their bodies are very different. So they're three-dimensional tissues. So remember I said the algae are only a single cell thick. Um, these, the bodies of land plants are thicker than that and that helps them avoid water loss. Um, their tissues are complex. They'll have multiple types of tissues. Um, so tissues and organs with specialized functions. And those different tissues will arise from a structure called the apical meristem. This is special tissue at the end of growing tips that, that has a regenerative property. So it's it's almost like stem cells. You could kind of compare it to stem cells in, in, in humans in the sense that it can, again, regenerate different types of tissues. And so this allows them and helps them form thick, robust bodies because they have these meristems that can grow um, and allows them to have these specialized tissues um, that provide different functions. Um, so they're not going to all be the same, basically. They have different parts of their body. And so if you think about a modern plant, think leaves, stems, flowers, that's all something that land plants can do and algae don't. Um, their reproduction is different. So they have sexual reproduction. It's going to be more complex than algae. It involves an alternation of generations. It's also called a sporic life cycle. It's another um, name for it. Um, 
oh, going along with the sporic life cycle, they're going to produce a reproductive cell um, called a spore. And the spore is resistant to drying out. And so the spore will be able to travel um, it through the air without drying out. Um, and then they're also going to have specialized structures that allow them to focus on reproductive cell um, production. So um, sporangia that will produce spores, gametangia that will, that will make gametes. So they have special structures for production of reproductive cells. This improves their rate of reproduction because they can make more reproductive cells. There are nine plant phyla. So I have listed here both their common names as well as the um, scientific name. So we have the liverworts, hepatophyta, the true mosses, bryophyta, hornworts, anthocerophyta, lycophytes, lycopodiophyta, pteridophytes, the pteridophyta, cycads, cycadophyta, ginkgos, ginkgophyta, conifers, coniferophyta, angiosperms, anthophyta. Um, and so there's some major categories here that I just want to point out to you. So these three here are the non-vascular plants. They're also many times referred to oops, as bryophytes without a capital B. So notice that bryophyta, the phylum, has a capital B but these are historically oftentimes referred to as bryophytes. They also get referred to as mosses, like for example, club mosses. Um, and so again, that's why these ones have the designation true mosses. So these are some other names that non-vascular plants sometimes get called. These two together, the lycophytes and the pteridophytes are the seedless vascular plants. And so notice that these ones were non-vascular. These ones are now vascular, but they don't make seeds. And then we have the oops, seed plants. So these ones are all collectively seed plants. So again, notice these ones were seedless. These ones now make seeds. Um, these here, six, seven, and eight, are the gymnosperms, which refers to naked seeds, as we'll talk about. And then the angiosperms are your flowering plants. Okay, so another name for them. So we're going to get into all the details about these different nine plant phyla. I want to just make you aware that there's the cladogram in your textbook um, that you'll see that has the different plant phyla. So um, starting here with the liverwort, so this is kingdom plantae. It highlights many of the traits that we're going to talk about that are the defining characteristics of the different plant phyla. It also has these groups that I talked about and then shows us our green algae phylum chlorophyta relatives and showing how the complex streptophyte algae are the most recent ancestors sharing those traits of the plasmodesmata, um, the cell plate, and sexual reproduction. So that's an overview of the land plants and algal relatives.